The following podcast is not relating to my teachings and work at Del Cedar Medical Center and is for entertainment purposes only. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Life of Flow. And today I was super excited for this uh, interview. Uh, it is James Sexton. James is a divorce lawyer and an author. And his book is If You're in My Office, It's Already Too Late. And we had a great conversation about something that, you know, unfortunately, us surgeons and vascular surgeons and doctors have to confront in life and that is divorce and difficulties in relationship but we had a great kind of candid funny conversation uh and lighthearted about it and it was a good one it was kind of one of my favorites so Mm -hmm. far so hope you guys enjoy and yeah let's do it two vascular surgeons walk into a bar and come out with a podcast we are talking everything vascular and not Welcome to the Life of Flow podcast. All right, everyone. Welcome to a, uh, another episode of Life of Flow. Today, I'm super excited. We have James Sexton, a divorce lawyer, author uh, of an amazing book. Uh, and he's here today to talk about something that some of us, unfortunately, me included, are pretty familiar, which are which is divorce uh, oh, and be, marriage. Been there, done that. Been there, mm-hmm. done that. Uh, you got a hundred percent batting average right here, guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 so you know, um, James, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you, thank you for coming and taking some some time and, and spending time with us. Uh, Thanks, yeah. guys. Great to be here. I was I was actually really happy to get the invite, and uh, it's nice to to sit down with uh, fellow professionals and and talk about stuff we all grapple with. Yeah, um, I, I want to say also, yeah, like, I think that James is our, like, most famous thus far. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're scaling up yeah, the Yeah, I mean, the you just did ladder. the Lex Friedman podcast, so. I just did Lex Friedman, I, yep, yeah. I've done, I've done some big ones, I have some even bigger ones coming up. And, that is awesome, uh, no spoilers. It's very weird, it caught fire about four or five months ago, I, I wrote my book in 2019, and I did a lot of media from then on. And it picked up pace. I did Access Hollywood. I became a regular correspondent for them. I had a regular segment on the Steve Harvey show. But, you know, like like you, I have a demanding career. And, and this was like a side project. You know, it was sort of a, a way to use a different muscle and, and, um, and, and to engage in conversations that I thought were interesting conversations. There's a lot of parallels, really, between, you know, what, what we're, we're both doing here. And, uh, yeah, when I did that Soft White Underbelly interview... Uh, for Mark Liotta, and I always liked that channel. It's an interesting channel yeah. where, if you're not familiar with it, it it he just talks to people on sort of the outskirts of society, people that don't get a lot of media attention necessarily, uh, people with you know substance use issues, homelessness, you know those kinds of things, and he really gets into these deep interviews with them where he talks about you know what's going on in their lives, and it's interesting for 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 our respective professions because you know. We're constantly dealing with people, but we're dealing with people in a very specific way. You know, you're addressing, you know, their, their vascular surgical issues that need to be addressed. And, and I'm addressing the legal issues that they're facing. But, you know, a lot of times when you hear people's backstories, like it just, it gives you so much more depth of understanding of this person and so much more empathy for what they've gone through. So I, I got a call from Mark and I did his interview and, you know, I just sat there and talked for an hour and a half. And I thought, well, you know, I don't know if this is interesting <laughs> to anybody. And he'd sent me a text a few hours later saying, oh my God, I've done thousands of interviews and this was one of the best ones I've ever had. This is going to get 4 million views. Just watch. Wow. And wow. I thought, oh, you say that to all the boys. I bet. <laughs> you know, so, and, uh, and sure enough, it went up and it had like a million and a half hits within a week. And wow. it's up to almost, I think, 5 million views. And, uh, and that opened the doors to a, a lot of bigger platforms. And when I did Lex, that, that of course was huge as well. And, and I have some even bigger ones coming up. So, but this is actually a conversation I was, I was really excited to have because I've not had occasion really to talk to. I like to talk to people who are, living lives different than my own, dealing with stresses different than my own. And then I think there's a tremendous amount of commonality to be found uh, in terms of the overlap of the things we're all dealing with. And I think in in such an increasingly fractured world as we live in right now, I actually think that's the only way that dial's ever going to move forward is for all of us to realize how how much we all have in common. So I'm I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. We're we're very humbled. Um, The the followers here are 
in the cardiovascular medicine business. Uh, we've got probably about half and half, half meaning physicians. And then we've gotten a lot of people in the business of like device representatives or salespeople or territory managers. And it seems like we're all kind of like in that sort of mix. And I'd like to kind of say, what, what do you think about this particular niche? Again, we're very appreciative you elected to be here, but what is it about us physicians that potentially makes us a little bit different and I believe statistically higher risk to get in trouble with our relationships? Yeah, I mean, that's the question, right? Like that's the key question for 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 you and for the people who are, you know, your audience. And and um, I, I think there's a lot there to unpack. So the, the first thing is I, I think physicians in general and surgeons specifically are have a skill set automatically that you would think will make them better at marriage or monogamy or long-term relationships. And that is in order to be a physician in general, and certainly in order to be a surgeon, you have to be good at delayed gratification. Like you, you know, I mean, I have a couple of friends who are surgeons, one of whom is a vascular surgeon who I trained Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with, which by the way, I'm always astounded that a vascular surgeon, a successful vascular surgeon is training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. I said to him, I'm like, your hands are constantly getting mauled in Jiu Jitsu. How are you doing this? Like if I'm, I get fingers broken, it's not gonna, no one's gonna care if their divorce lawyer has broken fingers, but a vascular surgeon, you know, you might need these things, but nevertheless, he, he still loves it. Josh Bearheim, amazing guy, Valley Hospital. Ridgewood, New Jersey. But, you know, look, I, I think physicians and surgeons in general are used to trading what they want now for what they want most. I mean, you, you would not, no one would spend their entire 20s and even into their 30s doing the rigorous work necessary to become a physician or a surgeon um, who wasn't able to, you know, say, hey, my eyes are on the prize. I, I know what I want and I want to I want to trade what I want right now, the gratification I want immediately for what I want most. Um, and that should translate actually into marriage being successful because marriage is very often about keeping your eye on the ball, remembering the plot of the story you're trying to write with your partner, you know, not being distracted by the shiny object, you know, the, the compelling other person, you know, and, and saying, no, no, I want what I have. I want to stay with what I have. Um, I'm going to be disciplined in my approach to things. Um, and in fact, surgeons have a lower overall divorce rate average, 33% um, among physicians. So as physicians go, physicians have a higher divorce rate, as do lawyers, than the general public. But among physicians, the highest rate of divorce is psychiatrists, and among the lower is surgeons at 33%. Um, but, but, you know, one of the things that, so that's what we have going for us in theory, right? You have going for you in theory that you can delay gratification, you keep your eyes on the prize. But I would also, and also by the way, very often people are marrying later when they're physicians or surgeons because they wanna wait until they're finished with their education or finished with their residency before they marry. Um, although that's not always the case. Um, and, and the older people are when they marry, um, statistically, the, the less likely they are to the divorce, um, although it's not a giant statistical difference. So what works against them, of course, is these are high stress professions, high demand professions. These are professions where you're not able to just say, OK, I'm unplugging now. It's like I'm unplugging mostly now, except for an emergency. Right. And you have a duty to someone other than your family. You have a duty to the people who have entrusted their care to you. I mean, legally even, you have a duty of care, you know, which is something the general public does not have. When you're a physician, a surgeon, you have a duty of care. So, you know, that I think certainly puts a tremendous weight on people. Um, in my experience, and I've represented a lot of physicians and a lot of surgeons, um, I, I, because I, I, again, I work in Manhattan, so there's a tremendous, you know, huge medical community and some amazing institutions in Manhattan and that surrounding area. So I've, I've, I've represented some really elite surgeons, world-class surgeons, people who people travel from all over the world to be with. Um, Memorial Sloan Kettering, for example, is a, a hospital where I've represented a number of the physicians and surgeons there. And these are people who, you know, people will, you know, they, they have people from all over the world following them around as residents. You know, they have people traveling from the UAE to receive care from yeah. them. And I think that's a situation where, 
you know, there are tremendous demands placed on a person intellectually, emotionally, and time-wise that is potentially antagonistic to a marriage. Um, and surgeons and physicians, in my experience, fall into one of two tranches. They either marry someone they went to school with, right? Like a lot of physicians marry people they met in medical school uh -huh. and they ma marry fellow physicians or they marry someone who they met during residency or in their early work life. And they, so they marry another physician or they fall into the category of they marry someone who is completely detached from that world. And it's sort of that barefoot in the park thing. You know, you've got the surgeon married to the yoga teacher, um, <laughs> you know, and sometimes that really works because there's a polarity, a wonderful polarity there. You have someone with a high stress job who's married to someone with a lower stress job and the physician or surgeon, you know, who, who is an organized, methodical, thoughtful, planning oriented person is, is a good offset for the person who's sort of hippy dippy and perhaps more chill. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of lighten up the physician or surgeon. So that sometimes is a wonderful balance. But again, sometimes the things that attract us to people are the things that eventually cause us to be repelled from that person, you know, because it's charming when you're first dating someone or first married to someone that it's like, oh, this person's so lighthearted and they kind of pull me out of my own zone. And then after you're married to them for three or four years, you're like, oh my God, get your act together. Like, like we have to have an organized life here. Like, and it's no longer cute, you know? And by the way, in their defense, in defense of, of the spouses or former spouses, you know, they think it's incredible. Well, I'm, I'm married to this person who has this very high stress, high power job and people are, you know, like deferring to them and they're getting emergency calls and they're like a superhero to people, you know, um, and that's really amazing and charming and very cool to tell their friends. But after you've been married to somebody for five, six years, like and your phone's ringing at 2 a.m. and they're like, yeah, I got to get back to the hospital. Or I gotta run. That gets old fast, <laughs> you know, yeah. yes, and, and then I think it's very hard when you are that person, right? When you're the physician or the surgeon or the trial lawyer, and this is a commonality we have in our respective professions, where when the person says, oh, really, like again, you gotta cancel plans because you got this emergency at work to deal with, it, of course they have a point, right? They have a point, like they want your time, they love you, they wanna be with you, you know? Like that's a beautiful, lovely, wonderful thing. But as a human being, I, I can tell you when that's happened to me, my response to that is, okay, what I'm as advertised. Like you, <laughs> yeah. you knew I do this for a living. Like you used to think it was charming that I was Superman to so many people. And now you're upset about it. And by the way, I, I don't notice you not using the credit card. Like I, I, this is something I'm doing not for fun, but for pay. So, you know, there is this, this feeling of everybody's right. You know what I mean? But yeah. you can be right or you can be happy, you yeah. know? So I, I think a lot of what I try to do in my work is create a kind of radical empathy to the extent that I can, right, for people. Because I, I think we all have a point and we all have a right to feel the way we feel. And by the way, even if we don't have a right to feel the way we feel, we feel the way we feel, right? Like you can apologize for your feelings, but you feel the way you feel. So we have to deal with the reality of our feelings, like what someone else feels and what we feel, whether it's fair or not, it's how we feel. So I, I think for physicians and surgeons who, you know, again, by definition, they're a lot like the quant people that I represent in finance in the city. Like they're mathematically minded, they're scientifically minded. I mean, surgeons in particular are a weird, I love you guys, but you're weird. Like you're, <laughs> cause you're a blend of an artist and a craftsperson you know, like the hands of an artist or a sculptor or a painter, really, in terms of dexterity and precision and, and having to do and practice things tens of thousands of times, combined with a mathematical and science mind, which is not something you see all the time in one person. So in all genius, there's madness, you know, and I think that um, when it works, you know, it works wonderfully. Like when someone loves that madness of you and loves that advertised, you know, who you are, the sort of genius slash madness of it. It's a beautiful thing, but it's also somewhat understandable when people grow weary of it. You know, I, I, uh, I was talking to my son recently, who's a, a newly admitted attorney. He's been an attorney for about two years. And I said something about, you know, how I was just exhausted after a number of trials I'd had. And I said, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm not having fun right now. And he said, but dad, you love your job. I said, well, I can love something and not be having fun at it. 
Yeah. You know, like I love my job, but it's not always fun. Like it's some like I love sex, but if I did it for 14 hours a day, nine days in a row, I'd need a nap or I'd be like, I'd be a little tired of it. Yeah. So, you know, we have a love for the work we do. Hopefully we have a passion for the work we do. We have a dedication to it. And certainly we've all sacrificed years and years of our most potent, vibrant years, our twenties, our thirties, building careers, building an educational skill set. Um, so we love and are devoted to this thing, but it's often antagonistic to the other beautiful things in life. And your book, um, you know, you have a lot of insights into people's, uh, I guess, I don't know, I call them habits and habits that are probably detrimental to, to long-term relationships. Uh, and we were talking yesterday and where we were recording some other podcasts about, you know, the, the habits that we pick up through life to deal with stress and to, and to soothe the stress. And I'm, I'm stealing that from a friend that we're soothing. Um, and you know, and we were talking, it's like one of my, my habits that I think it's probably not good for me is just to get home when I'm really, really stressed out of and tired, mentally exhausted and just lay on the couch and just like throw, you know, uh, scroll through YouTube instead of going for like a walk with my dog or my girlfriend or like something like that, that makes me happy. I do something that just makes me whatever, tired, more tired, anxious, probably, and, and, and doesn't give me anything in life. Have you picked up any habits that surgeons or maybe some of our interventional cardiologists, interventional radiologists, friends to listen to also have picked up that are detrimental to marriage that are specific to, yeah. to what we do? Yeah, yeah. I, I actually had a client who was a electrophysiologist. They they worked in um, pacemakers and things like that. And, and I've, I've represented a number of, of, of specifically vascular surgeons. And on, I've represented a lot of oncological. I had like a whole run with Memorial Sloan Kettering. Because what happens in this profession is like you represent one cardiologist. And all of a sudden for like three, four years, you've got a bunch of cardiologists because yeah. people talk to each other, you know, and they go, oh, you got to hire my guy. He was great. Or they, oh, you got to hire the guy my wife hired. He was great. And he killed me. <laughs> so, like, that's how I got my first surgeon as I represented yeah. his wife, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and I guess he was talking to a friend. And, and when I said to the guy, oh, how'd you get my name? He goes, well, I'm not supposed to tell you. And I said, well, that's weird. And he said, no, I. You represented this guy's wife, one of my colleagues' wives, and he said, "Yeah, don't hire the guy I used. Hire the guy my wife used." <laughs> well, the humor of that is, I actually ended up representing his, his. I ended up re representing his friend, who was a fellow surgeon, and uh, he kept saying to me, "Like, oh yeah, my friend was saying that," and I said, "Yeah." I said, "By the way, let him know. Like, it was never personal. Like, if yeah, he'd come to my office 15 minutes before his wife, I'd have, Taking I'd have been his arguing case, his yeah. side of the case. Like, we're you know." Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I, I think what you're touching on there is, is important stuff. So first of all, like how we self soothe, and I like that word too. I like the word soothing because I think we are, you know, at, at, look, we're, we're as a, as a man, you know, we're hesitant to be like self care day, you know, but like the <laughs> truth is like there, there's value to realizing that we all deserve, we all have a child in us. We all are human. We all want to be soothed. We all want to relax. Like I, I have very successful friends in very high performance, you know, C-suite executives who play Call of Duty on their mm -hmm. Xbox, you know, and these are grown men in their 40s and 50s, but this is very soothing for them. It's mindless. I have friends who, you know, like I, I like to play blackjack when I go to Las Vegas. I don't do it very often, but when I do, I love to play because it's kind of mindless. It's meditative. You know, it's a thing you can just sort of do and, and you don't have to think too much and you only have to add a certain amount, you know, so. Um, I think it's good to have things that, that allow you to self-soothe. Um, but the interesting question is why, when you talk about like scrolling through on YouTube and you know what you're doing, well, first of all, YouTube's got the algorithm and that algorithm actually knows you really well, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. like I, I have to tell you, YouTube, I love going through YouTube because it just seems to know what I'm into, you know, in a way that I don't even know many romantic partners do. You know, because they don't have full access to my cookies the way that uh, yeah. that that, that, that uh, YouTube does. You know, they haven't done a deep dive, a data dive through all of my metadata, thank God. So, uh, you know, you, YouTube, TikTok, you know, Instagram, like it has access to very private information and can give you what you want. Right. So so I don't fault anybody for saying I want to be given what I want. And I also think in your profession and related professions. 
it's a tremendous amount of interaction you have with other people every day. Like you're, you're cons, you have a social job. People don't think of what physicians and surgeons do as social, particularly surgeons, because you have this image of just the guy scrubbing in and walking in and it's like, okay, well, this is very solitary and I'm just putting on my performance here and then I walk out and that's it. But really think of how many people you have to interact with in a day at work, right? Not just following up, not just consultations, but just day-to-day -day interactions with colleagues, with all of the various people who work within the context of a hospital or a physician physician's office you know so so when you have downtime sometimes you may just not want to be social you just want to be quiet you don't want to be spoken to you don't want anyone to try to pick your brain you know I, I jokingly say like I would love someone to just want me for my body you know I think I'm past the time but like it, it, because most of the time people want my mind People want to hear what I have to say. And, and in my free time, when someone goes, oh, you're a divorce lawyer. Oh, my God, I have a friend who got divorced. And I'm like, are you seriously going to talk to me about divorce right now? <laughs> like this, is, I mean, it really is the equivalent of me saying, you guys, you know, by the way, while I have you here, can you look at this mole? You know, like, it's yeah. like, okay, A, not my area. B, really? Like right now, this is my free time. You want to do that? That's like the last thing I want. So I, I would think that in a, ideal situation your romantic partner would know and remember our romantic partners can't hear what we don't say but but it's important that they understand this is not a rejection of them this is not I don't want to go for a walk with you this is you know right now I don't really know that I want to talk and interact because that's all I've been doing is talking and interacting and so if I could walk silently with you you know, or if I could, and again, remember, our professions are professions that by definition, people come to you to solve a problem. That's it. Like our job is the same job. You're here to solve a problem. I'm here to solve a problem. Your problems have to do with, you know, vascular disease. My problems have to do with people's marriage and family situation. But we're here to solve problems. So when I'm hearing anything from anyone, even a love of my life, you know, when she says to me like, oh, yeah, this happened with my sister, my brain immediately goes to the mode of, okay, well, what could she do? And yeah. what might be the root cause of that? And, you know, how could she address it? And what are the side effects and potential second order effects of what? Because you can't do that five days a week all day and then just turn it off. You know, because, because, oh, it's, it's after 5 p.m. on Friday. Now my brain, I just, it'll turn it off and it'll work differently now. So sometimes I, I think, that that YouTube scrolling, that playing video games, that doing jujitsu or going to the gym, that that antisocial disconnected thing, sometimes it's a way to transition from the constant need, constant social interaction, constant problem solving into a different mode of being. But again, with the way our work weeks are structured, you know, it's hard to do because it's like I always tell people when I go on vacation, it takes me the first two days just to calm down. And then it takes me like the last two days to get myself sort of I start the tension of, OK, when I get back, I've got this to do. So basically, if I go away for a week, I got like three days. I got three days where I'm actually vacationing. And I think it's the same thing for all of us. When you get home from work, you don't immediately turn work off. You, you, you don't immediately stop thinking about it. So I think that's another thing we have to be honest with ourselves about, forgiving of ourselves about, and also we have to find ways to share it with our partner and have our partner understand. And that's why I was saying when people, when physicians marry physicians or surgeons marry surgeons, it's sometimes a perfect storm. Because although there's more understanding, like this person understands how you might be feeling and they're feeling... They're feeling in a similar way. So it's like two stressed, high pressure people. It's two high pressure systems moving into the same thing. That's challenging sometimes. But again, the barefoot in the park, like physician, surgeon married to a yoga teacher, married to a school teacher, you know, they don't understand what you're dealing with and what you're going through. So, so again, there's no right answer. It's just a question of like, which set of problems do you want to have? <laughs> One thing that was very <clears throat> kind of eye-opening for me in, in this last year was the realization that in, in in this thing that you you put it very nicely this this you're an artist combined with a mathematician in this dichotomy that we live in that we choose to follow is one that is 
essentially propelled by selfishness, right? The intention to grow, the intention to gain power, the intention to be the best of the best in a highly competitive market where you are uh, taking tests to prove yourself, uh, where you're uh, proving yourself in patient care. Uh, and then you get to one place and then <laughs> residency isn't enough. So then you have to do a fellowship and fellowship isn't enough to do a sub fellowship. And I feel that marriage in that became almost like a, like a complementary need that I had in a very selfish way. And I say this because the moment that I realized, you know, that I, and I've told this to my wife, so I don't really care that she uh, listens to this again, but I said, you know, I, I think I married you. It's still being selfish, right? Like I wasn't, I wasn't giving myself to you. I was essentially finding what you could do for me yeah. in, in my, in this, in this construction of power. And the one moment when, when everything changed is when we had our kid and uh, our, our baby is now going to be a year old. And I remember probably within the first couple of weeks um, of being home and then just essentially being with this beautiful creature that can't talk, but is present with you that would just open their little eyes and look at you. And I felt like there was this just absolutely odd, out of left field change that gave me the absolute perspective and say, wow, I don't necessarily think all this other shit that I've been doing matters mm -hmm. at this point, at least. And, and I don't know if that changes as they grow up, probably. But right now, I am in a mode where I don't care that my career necessarily has this trajectory that I always thought it, it should have. But here's the funny part and the fucked up part is, <laughs> is the same for the marriage, right? Because everything in me right now is about protecting and about gathering and giving this one beautiful entity in our lives everything that I can. And there's somewhat of a sacrifice, I think, of, of what this other selfish project was, which was called marriage, right? But it then puts into perspective, holy shit, we really have to work for this, right? Because I can see how easy this could derail given, given the set of circumstances that has led us to this, uh, you know, and I come home and all I want us to do is, you know, I want to bust that door open and hug my baby. Yeah. And my wife is the one giving him to me. Right. And I can see her smile seeing that, but at the same time, I always, you know, I go and I hug her too, yeah. but it's a bit, it's, you know, I, I don't, how fucked up James. <laughs> see, I have to tell you, I think that's beautiful. I think it's beautiful, and I think I, it really is. And I think it's beautiful, and I think it it bodes so well for your future because the things you're saying, and I'm further down the path. Like I, I, I am. I was a cautionary tale as a professional because my children were born. My 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 youngest child, who's now 24, was born when I was finishing law school, and I I was like you know, success was plan A and there was no plan B. Like I had no safety net. It was get rich or die trying. Like that was it. Like I got to pass the bar. I got to start a firm. I got to make that firm successful. And that was the priority. And I, as you were saying what you were saying, I, I, I thought to myself, wow, I remember that. Like I remember coming home from a long day at work and I remember very often, like I try to get home before my oldest was asleep. Yep. Yep. Um, but, but he would sometimes be asleep and I used to go into his room and I would just smell him. Mm -hmm. Like I would just yeah. smell, he smelled like the baby shampoo and like the little, you know, little kid toothpaste that they use. And I, I would remember, sometimes I would just lay there and like feel his breath. I would just sort of hug him. He was asleep. I don't want to wake him up, but I would just lay there and I'd be in my suit. I have this image in my head. I remember it so vividly. And I remember I sometimes felt something so profound. I, I almost wanted to weep. Correct. It was a feeling of like, oh my God, I love this thing so much. Like, and I want to do such a good job. I want to protect and provide and I want to be a good father. And I also 
want to be here and not miss all of it. But I also have all of these things I want to do and need to do so that I can provide and protect and be a good provider and good, good parent. But I'm also, in order to do those things, going to miss so much of what's going on. And I just remember feeling so conflicted. But, you know, what you'll see, because you're early in the parenting journey, is that um, what I learned probably later than, than I should have, and that is that your, your children are an amazing um, wake-up call. In the sense that, yes, they need and want a lot of things. Like kids are expensive. Like when, you know, like you could have a Ferrari or a kid, you know, and, and, and a kid's way more expensive than a Ferrari. You just pay over a longer period. The, the loan is amortized, you know. But I have to tell you, like you, they just want you. Like they just want your time. They just love you. Like you, you know, mom and dad like, is the name of God on the lips of children. Like they just love you, especially when they're that little. And, and it's finite. Like it's going to end. I mean, there was a time where my sons, you know, you could say to them like, Hey, do you want to go to the circus with mommy? Or do you want to like watch me shave? And they were like, Oh my God, I want you. So like, they would do anything with me. You want to go to Home Depot with me? Oh my God. Yes. Like, and then one day when they're like in middle school or high school, you go, hey guys, you want to go to the movies? And they're like, yeah, no, I was going to sit in a room with a bunch of my friends and I'll look at our phones. <laughs> and you're like, oh, well, we could go like get pizza and then we could like, I'm going to take the whole day off and we could get something to eat and we could go do, you know, we can go, go to Dave and Buster's and play video games. And they're like, yeah, no, we were going to actually hang out at the, the convenience store and see if girls walk by. And you're like, wow, like this is over. I missed it, you know? So, but one of the things you said that I want to push back on a little bit is the idea that marriage is selfish, right? Like that, that marriage, as as you viewed it, or as perhaps it fit into the order of your life, right? Into the cabinet of, of your life. It, it was there for a selfish reason. I, I think, you know, people love throwing around the word narcissist, right? Like that's one of the new buzzwords, like gaslight, narcissist. These are like trauma. These are the three words that like everybody's <laughs> using now. I don't know if like Oprah must have used them at some point. Now everybody's just freaking using them. But it's like the lexicon now. Every single client comes in and says he's a narcissist. He gaslights me. Okay. Yeah. And then I do a little deeper of a dive and go, well, what do you mean? And, and so most of the time when people refer to a narcissist, they're referring to a person who's selfish. And sometimes when people are referring to someone who's selfish, they're actually just referring to someone who's self-interested. Because there's a difference between being selfish and being self-interested. And, and I don't think anybody gets married that isn't in part doing it for a self-interested reason. Like, mm -hmm. why would you marry someone for a completely selfless reason? I mean, I think at best, marriage is a symbiosis. You know, marriage is mutual benefit and mutual sacrifice. You know, we're giving and we're getting. And there's a mutuality of consideration, to yeah, put it in lawyer like terms. mutual self-interest. Yeah, but but right? I, can, sure. I can relate because, like, when, when we were um, interviewing for general surgery residency, I remember I went to New York. Um, to a place there and the program director said you know uh more people are like you know attacked by sh or like it is more common to be attacked by sharks than to be a surgeon you guys are so special and then during the during the whole process um you kind of like have this thing that because you exert yourself to such a degree you know you are special and you know it's 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 kind of a mind fuck, uh, the sleep deprivation, the, you know, I always felt that if I gave less than a hundred percent, I was a failure. Like there was like the only acceptable, you know, result was a hundred percent at all times. Yeah. Uh, and there are aspects of your career where if you hadn't given a hundred percent, you wouldn't get to the next level. Yeah. You wouldn't get to the next place. I mean, medical school, is a pie eating contest where the prize is more pie. Like, you know, you're, you're, you're just doing, you know, work really hard in med school. Why? So you can get the best grades so you can get the best residency place. Okay. Now yeah. do the best in the residency so that you can get the best fellowship. Like, like yeah. when does this stop? I know, you know, and the answer is like, you keep pushing and pushing. And push, so you're constantly feeling like a failure. 
Because you're constantly feeling like, oh my God, if I mess up this hurdle, everything I've sacrificed was useless. So I got to keep pushing. And that doesn't end the minute you're done with your education. I mean, then it becomes, how do I become assistant chief? How do I become chief? How do I move up in the ranks here? How do I get a better, you know, class of, 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 of patients or of a practice? How do I, how do I create a lifestyle that's going to fit better professionally? But, but again, so you're constantly competing with yourself and with others who are all among the elite as well, because they've all, you know, uh, uh, met some of the same milestones as you. And then you go home and you're just a person. You're just a person who's got to take out the garbage and who somebody's got to wash their underwear. And like, you're just a person, you know? And, and that's, I think, challenging for people too. It's challenging to be the kind of person who people, people are willing to pay both of you and me just to talk to them. Like, think about that. Like, we can get paid just to tell people our perspective on something they're dealing with, how we might solve their problem. I mean, you have an additional layer where you have something in your brain and something you can do with your hands. You know, I don't need the hands. I, they, I just have the brain to offer. So you guys have an even higher level. But then you go home and, you know, your kid just wants you to read them a story. Your spouse just wants to tell you about their story stupid day you know and and you're sitting here going listen all day people have been throwing problems at me and those problems are things like they're things that could cause them to die if handled poorly and now i'm supposed to seem interested in what's going on with your fucking cousin like i'm sorry like i'm sorry i can't do that imitation like i i, I have a couple of hours free right now and you're telling me about what's going on with your cousin and i'm sitting here going okay we got to land this plane like what where is the story going like what like but the truth is again you have the right to feel that way your spouse also has the right to want to be able to share things with you about their stupid cousin you know so we we have to find a way and and this is the practice i've tried with my own life to to not hear it as a criticism and not hear it defensively when when you know i'm not meeting the needs of this other person because look they're here selfishly too like your spouse has selfish intentions i don't mean that negatively i i would say self-interested instead of selfish like i think you know your spouse married you for i hope self-interested reasons that she's like oh this is a person who's going to yeah. give me a good life and be a, a good companion that'll give me pleasure you know and that'll give me some security like these are the reasons we marry i, I hope you didn't go well i guess i'm ready to bite the bullet and marry this person like i hope you didn't say that when you chose your spouse i hope it was like oh yeah yeah like i'm gonna get a lot out of this and i'm gonna give some things to it as well you know so i i I really think, though, that that um, one of the things I talk about in the book, uh, and I've talked about in some of my other, you know, media stuff, is that there are better ways, and it, it would be great if our spouses and partners, you know, tried to understand us a little better. But again, they they can't hear what we don't say, um, and the way that they might parse it to us, I think, would have value if they parsed it differently. The example I, I frequently give, and I apologize if, if you've heard it before. Um, is, you know, in my profession, you're really supposed to look the part of a lawyer. Like you're supposed to look like a, you know, like a, like a Perry Mason or, you know, you're supposed to have that clean cut, like Tom Cruise and a few good men. You know, you're supposed to wear like the nice suit and be clean shaven, short haircut, you don't have an earring. Like you're supposed to fit a mold. You know, you're dealing with a lot of elderly judges who they want you to look like what they imagine a lawyer should look like. And by the way, clients want you to look like what a, you know, what a, what a, what a lawyer looks like. And so part of that was being clean shaven. You know, this is the weekend now, so I'm, I'm, I'm not clean shaven today. But I have, a, I have a thick beard that grows in very fast and it's dark. So I have to shave every day during the week in order to play the lawyer role, you know. So on the weekends, I like to not shave because it's like give my face a break and it's just nice to not have to shave. And I remember I was dating a woman that she had very sensitive skin. And every time I would like kiss her or kiss her neck or kiss her cheek, she would... If I hadn't, if I wasn't freshly shaven, she would be like, oh God, your face is so scratchy. And I remember it would, it would upset me so much. I sometimes wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything, but like in my heart, I would think, really? Like you get you know what? Maybe, that, maybe I just shouldn't kiss you then. Like, like I got to shave all week. I can't have two days where I don't have to drag a razor across my face. Like I'm kissing you. Like that's a nice thing to do. You don't have to complain about the fact that I'm giving you, you know, some kind of, oh, I'm upsetting your delicate skin. Really? Like, come on, you know? 
And it wasn't the best way to express that to me, you know? And of course, not surprisingly, it didn't work out with that woman. <laughs> but, but the next woman I dated had the exact same issue. But the way that she handled it, I think, was genius. And I learned a lot from it. And that is when I would, you know, if she'd spend the night on Sunday night and I would shave Monday morning, she would come in and she'd kiss me after I'd shaved and she'd go, oh, God, I love it. I love when your skin is like freshly shaven. It's like so sexy. You're like Don Draper and Mad Men, you know. And, and I was like, oh, yeah. She's like, oh, my God, it's so hot. Like, I love, like, the feel of, like, your freshly you know, shaved face on my neck. And I was, dude, I, was, I would have shaved three times a day. Like, I, I was like, okay. And I, I actually would, like, shave on the weekends when I was going to see her. And I'd be like, oh, yeah. You know, I'd kiss her. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I just shaved. And she'd be like, I noticed. You know? Dude, how easy is that? Yeah. How easy is that? Like, so, so you, you accomplish the same thing, right? Which is you're trying to motivate or you're trying to accomplish the same thing. Get me to shave so I don't irritate your skin. And by the way, you have a right to not want your skin to be irritated. But there's a way to do that that's going to make me feel good about it. And there's a way to do it that's going to make me feel defensive about it. So I think that we're all being self-interested in a marriage. Otherwise, what's the point? If you're marrying someone out of a, like, you're, this is your duty to marry this person even though it's not in your interests, like, God help you, yeah. you know? Like, you're both there for some self-interested reasons, so why not identify clearly what they are for yourself and for your partner and try to serve them as best you can? Because that death spiral that relationships get into you know, where it's like, well, why should I do, why should I, you know, bring her home flowers? When's the last time that she, you know, just like initiated sex, you know, just for the hell of it, you know? Well, and meanwhile, she's thinking, why the hell should I initiate sex with him? He hasn't bought me flowers in six months. And now we're in a death spiral where we're just going to get worse and everyone's just going to be equally miserable because the other person failed to make them happy. But that can go the other way too, you know, where it's like you just start extending kindness to your partner and affection to your partner the way that you did when you were trying to close the deal when you were dating this person and maybe ideally that inspires in your partner a desire to do the same and then that makes it easier and more desirable for you to want to meet their needs so again listen physicians surgeons you're problem solvers by nature you're problem solvers like so so look at the problem the underlying problem i always tell people when you're when you're thinking about getting married, ask yourself, what is the problem to which marriage is a solution? Because anytime you, you use any technology, you should be asking yourself, what is the problem to which this technology is a solution? Do I have that problem? How does it solve that problem? And what second order effects, what new problems might it create in solving this other problem? Because if you ask those kinds of questions, I think you'll view marriage and relationship differently now james you we, we we've kind of superficially discussed this book um i want to say 2019 who you you mentioned yeah this when this, this book called if you're in my office it's already too late a divorce lawyer's guide to staying together that's the title of your book right correct um what if you if you if you don't mind leads you to write this because in a way here's what I'm hearing from you is you could probably have a phenomenal career in marriage counseling hmm. and get away from the you know the 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 work that goes into breaking it up or destroying it or or or, or amicably as possibly ending it so <laughs> so a you know, what happened that you decided, hey, guys, it's time for me to write something from all the shit I've learned yeah. and hopefully get you to not come to me. But at the same way, that's somewhat self-destructive for your own career. And does that mean that you need to get yourself on a path of counseling and getting people to stay together? Uh, you know, what's what's the balance in that in that uh, yeah. change? Yeah, I appreciate that question. I, I, um, I was actually a psychology major as an undergraduate. Oh, and I did my master's degree and was working on my PhD and I was interested in becoming a therapist. And then it became very clear to me that the best th therapists listen more than they talk. Um, and, and I talk more than I listen. Like I'm, I'm, I'm chatty if you haven't figured that out. <laughs> um, and, and so I also, you know, look, we all contain multitudes, right? So I, I was a debater 
from high school on. Um, I love extemporaneous speaking. I love the performance aspect of being on trial. Um, I love the strategic chess match that is litigation, divorce litigation. And I love the human element that is divorce litigation. So I, I really feel like I'm in a profession that, that hit all the marks for me. Like I love my work. I, I really do. I love it. I, I, again, like sex, you know, I love it. But if I did it 14 hours a day, I'd get tired. Like I absolutely love my job. And at the time I wrote the book, I, I had been working just as a divorce litigator for 20 years and I were a little less than 20 years at that point. And I was listening to a podcast where Stephen King was being interviewed and I'm a voracious reader. And I sometimes when I'm on vacation, I like to read really fluffy stuff like Stephen King or a Jack Reacher novel, like, like the junk food equivalent of reading. Um, and Stephen King was talking about how he's such a prolific writer. And they said, how do you put out two, three books a year? And he said, well, it's really not that hard. If you write a page a day in a year, you have a book. So I thought, well, that's interesting. Like, I wonder if I could do that. Maybe I'll write a book. Like, maybe it might be a fun thing. I get up at 4 a.m. every day. It might be like a fun meditative thing to every half, like a half an hour in the morning before I work out or whatever I would write. And I started to think about, well, what could I write? You know, and I thought to myself, just as in your profession, listen, you know, by the time you, by the time I'm on the table, there's a lot of stuff I could have done to not be on your table. You know, like yeah. by the time, you know, I have, you know, a hundred percent, you know, obstruction of the left anterior descending, you know, like th there's, there's a lot I could have done to not have that happen, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I, I, I would be better to have this information as early as possible. Like if you could tell me while I was a young 20 something, Hey, here's how to have a healthy heart when you're 50. Here's how to have a healthy heart when you're 70. You know, here's the things you can start doing now, these little things you can do now. Well, it was the same thing for me. I just went, look, all of these people, by the time they're in my office, they, they, they're they so far gone. Like, they're so far. So what can I learn or what can I teach someone about, you know, preventative maintenance? What can I teach someone, like, by looking at how things break? How can we learn about how to keep them together? And so I started thinking about what are the things that I just hear over and over again. And see, so much of our culture is opinion, like it's speculation, you know. Whereas for me, it's like, listen, I, I'm just telling you what the people sitting at the chair. I've, I've facilitated the demise of thousands of marriages at this point. You know, and I look at it like I'm I'm there to bury what's dead. Like I don't, you know, I don't make it rain. I, I sell the umbrella. Like I don't, yeah. you know, you're not you're not out there shoving cheeseburgers down people's throats. Like you're dealing with the repercussions of people's bad choices. Or sometimes it's just God says any meeny miny mo, and this person has you know an issue that through no fault of their own, the healthiest person in the world, they follow all the right habits. So I I think for me, once I started using that muscle, um. It, it it actually made a lot of sense for me, but I have no desire to leave my profession at this point. Like I and do this full time. Like this is a a uh, a side hobby. I won't even call it a side hustle because it's not particularly lucrative. Um, but it's emotionally lucrative. I think it's rewarding in the sense that that um, I get to meet a lot of of people who are people I admire and who are interesting people and people whose whose um, struggles are the same as mine. You know. Um, and, and, and I also sometimes get to share my experience or observation, whether it's personal or professional with people in a way that I hope is going to help them in some fashion, stay on a path that, that, that may prevent them from ending up in my office or one like it. So, um, but yeah, it's, look, it's a human thing. I mean, guys, look, we're, we're all intelligent men. We, we wouldn't be in the professions we're in. We wouldn't be as successful as we are in the professions we're in if we weren't intelligent men. But let's be honest. Like, I can tell you this unequivocally. If we were just in it for the money, we'd all just be in finance. Like, my wealthiest clients are in finance, all of them. Like, I have entered people in entertainment, and they're worth, you know, five, ten million. You'd know them if you saw them on the street. You might ask for their autograph. But my clients in finance, they're worth seven billion dollars, eight billion dollars, four hundred million dollars. You know, that, so so we're not in it for the money. We're not just in it. Like we, yes, we, we have lucrative professions. You know what? I had, I had to sacrifice my entire 20s and most of my 30s to get where I am in my life. So I, I don't apologize for my fee. Um, but, but I will say that we're clearly not just in these professions for the money because if we were, we'd just be in finance. We're intelligent enough to be in finance if we wanted to be. So 
we're doing this for some reason because we like people and we like helping people. You know, that may not always be readily apparent because sometimes I think we all get exhausted and and we are in professions that feed our narcissism maybe a little bit, right? Like to be successful in these professions or even in the education required for these professions, you have to be self-interested, you have to push yourself, you have to believe in yourself. Um, and it's pretty easy to then have a lot of people also applauding you and believing in you and bowing down to you in their own ways. You know, when your time... You know, I, I still sometimes am shocked when I hear my administrative staff being like, well, Mr. Sexton's not available at that time. And I'm like, listen to that, Mr. Sexton, you know, <laughs> like there's still like a sense of like, well, I'm kind of somebody, you know, um, but but we're also just human, you know, and it's really, really hard to remember how to find that balance. Like that little boy or girl, that little one year old that you have at home, you know, you're just dad, like you're just okay. dad, it you know, happen. and. It's a great thing to be. It's an amazing thing to be, you know, and, and if you do it right, you know, I'm very blessed. I have two sons, ages 24 and 27, and I did not in any way push them to go into the law. And one is a successful lawyer and the other is in law school. Um, and it was not because I pushed it in any way. I said to them, find something you love, find, mm. do something you love. I have clients who are plumbers who make a lot more money than some of my physician clients, yeah, yeah. especially after managed care. <laughs> um, you know, but I have a lot of, I like I didn't push them, but I think they saw how much passion I have for what I do and how much I love it. And I, I think that helped influence what they're, and one of them, you know, is in law school, so it's a little too soon to tell. And the one who's a, an attorney is a successful attorney and he loves it. And what an amazing thing to have that little boy who I used to cuddle up next to and smell the, you know, Johnson's baby shampoo on his hair to now meet him at a restaurant in the city when he's wearing his tie and just got out of court and I just got out of court and I'm wearing my tie and he sits there and tells me about the motion to suppress that he filed today on it. And I just look at him and think like, I taught you that the cow says moo. <laughs> you know? Like, and now you know a whole bunch of stuff I don't know, you know, like, and you're, like, you're a lawyer, like, you're a, you're your own person, you know, like, and it's, that's the, the, and maybe I'm getting older and getting nostalgic, but I'm starting to realize that like, look, we're important. I think the work we do is important. I think the work you do is important. You've changed people's lives in your work and I've changed people's lives in my work. And that's a beautiful thing. And it's a humbling thing, but we're not that important. Like if you left your profession tomorrow, it's not like people would be like, well, where am I ever going to find a vascular surgeon? There's a Life lot of us. Down. There's a lot of you. Yeah. Like if I, it's not like people would stay married if I quit my job tomorrow, you know, or they couldn't <laughs> find another divorcer. So I think it's all about just finding that balance, you know, and finding at the risk of, of making a pun of the name, finding a, a flow, finding a way to sort of flow between self-interest and sacrifice to find a flow between the passion and devotion to our mission, our purpose, our work, and also to being kind to ourselves and being kind to the people in our lives who are lovely enough to tolerate the genius and madness of us, you know? Well, I'll tell you this. I don't think that you need to quit your job um, as a lawyer, and I hope you don't, because it sounds by all accounts that you are really good at it. But I think that there is a responsibility um, that comes with this power that you've been given. Um, your word uh, is 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 very strong. Your message is incredibly strong. It resonates with us. So the pursuit for advocacy and influence um, as as a as a message of mending uh, for a lot of us out there, I think is going to be important. I congratulate you on on this, and I. It took a long or a few years um, for it to 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 viralize, if you may. Um, but I hope that it viralizes even more so, and I hope that you get even more channels by which you can you can touch more lives, because I do believe that this message is is incredibly important. And and I hope. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that, Thank and you. I appreciate having the chance to talk to you both. And I I really think. There's tremendous value in what you're doing. I think speaking so candidly to a community of people who, although diverse, share a lot of the same challenges and struggles. I've, I've always thought 
you know, I, I like watching boxing and mixed martial arts. I've, I've always enjoyed that. And at the end of the fight, when, when the two people who've just spent the entire time beating the crap out of each other, when they hug, like it always gets me yeah. because there's something so beautiful about the fact that these two people have just tried to beat the crap out of each other, you yeah. know, for the last however many rounds, but that they have more in common than anyone else in that arena. Like there's thousands of people watching and they don't, those two people have the most in common because they both sacrificed and they both dieted and they both trained so hard and they both just spent the last however long getting the shit beat out of them by the other. <laughs> and so they, they have so much in common, you know, and we spend so much time in our respective professions, mine being directly adverse, you know, with opposing counsel, yours in being competitive with your colleagues, you know, and, and competitive with yourself in the desire to to raise up your own status as a as a professional and there's something really beautiful about what you're doing in that you're trying to sort of candidly bluntly honestly openly not in the performative instagram advertisement you know 100 best doctors in blah 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 way that we all advertise ourselves which we have to do i get it we have to do that for our professions but there's something wonderful about being vulnerable and honest about where you're struggling as a father as a husband as a professional as an employer as an employee that I, I just think if more professions reached out to their colleagues it's the two fighters in the ring hugging each other you know yeah. and so i applaud both of you for 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 doing something unique here you know in a world where there's just so much out there and so many people talking into microphones that don't have anything to say i think <laughs> y'all have a lot to say and i think it's great that you're you're doing it because you're doing your colleagues and your community and their spouses and their employees and their colleagues and partners in their practices like you're 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 giving those people so there are second order effects to all the things that you're doing that i think are really really valuable too so i hope you will also continue as you've wished for me continue in your profession because it sounds like you're both really good at it and you're both moving along in wonderful ways in it but also continue to share this this secondary message because I think it really has value and it moves everybody forward. So thank you for, for what you do and thank you for having me. Well, it was great, James. Again, thank you. And yeah. Yeah, go buy the book, go read it. Go buy the book, read it. Follow this guy. He's on a Just, curve. You can get it on brains. Audible. It's easier. Listen to me talk Listen. for eight and a half and, hours. And you read it yourself. Do you read your own book? Yeah, he does. Do I do. Yes, yeah. I do. And you're very yeah. funny. And you're very, very, very yeah. funny. So that I appreciate it's, that. The Audible yeah. book, people, yeah. it's Think It Out sells the book book like 10 yeah. to 1. Yeah. Because people like listening to me talk for eight and a half hours. <laughs> which I jokingly tell people is like seven and a half hours more than my ex-wife ever listened to me talk. So that's pretty good. All right, buddy. Thank you very much. See you guys.